Hey everybody, welcome to the Waldock Way. I'm Jessica, and today's video is going to be a join us for morning basket video. So you're gonna be joining us for what is our March morning basket. In case you don't know what our March morning basket is, I will link it up here so you can see all of the details of what is in it. But today's pro tip for morning basket is going to be if your child is totally engaged in something that is something or an activity they can do while you're reading aloud, let them stay engaged in it. So today Emily is obsessed with building with her building blocks, her wooden blocks, and some of these um, famous figure landmark cards that I laid out for her. It's what I strewed today. So instead of interrupting her and saying, hey, come on, let's do morning basket, or instead of trying to move all of that upstairs to do morning basket where we normally would do it, I am just going to bring the things that we're gonna do for morning basket down to her. And we're just gonna have morning basket right here where she's already at. Okay. So let's start with our devotion. Put them up. The Lord will fight for you. Plants have enemies of many shapes and sizes, from tiny bugs that like to nibble away their leaves to bigger animals that eat the whole leaf or plant. But plants can't exactly run away from danger, so how do they defend themselves? Some plants have tiny fur-like prickles on their leaves that help keep insects away. Others, like the rose, have thorns, which are basically extra sharp twigs. Still, others like the cactus have larger spikes called spines that keep bigger animals away. Then there are other plants that use a chemical def defense system. Their leaves might look tasty, but one bite and bleh, animals find themselves find them too bitter to eat, or they could even be poisonous. Some even put on a sticky sap that traps and kills any bugs that try to eat them. Plants might not be able to throw a punch or karate chop an enemy, but God still gave them a way to fight off their enemies. Can you imagine a plant karate chopping? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plants, fight back. <laughs> or doing the karate kick. <laughs> yeah, that would be funny, wouldn't it? Yeah, they're like, I But could you imagine a cactus doing karate? That would be really deadly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine that. Um, one kick, and you'll be dead. Yeah, it would hurt, yeah. huh? But I would like to watch some karate kick. And, but or to punch because actually the stem is like their whole body. Yeah. That's what they would have to use. That would be funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> they'd look kind of like a pogo. Yeah. Wow. And, then <laughs> and they would fall down. <laughs> That's funny. you pick Mad Libs next or Trivia next? Trivia. Trivia? I love trivia. Okay. So excited. All right. Astounding animals. A dog's eye has how many eyelids? One, two, three, or 422? I'm going to go with two eyelids, kind of like a camel. Nope. A dog actually has three eyelids on each eye. What? Mm -hmm. Okay, that is crazy. Can I eat the eyelids? No. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> one. True or false? Tigers and African lions would meet in the mo would meet in the mo would meet in the <laughs> wild. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go ahead and say no, cause they would be feisty to each other. Some cats don't get along. Well, you have to think about where they would live, though, in the wild. Do you think they would meet in the wild based off of where they live? Well, is that a cat? Uh, An African lion and a tiger. African lion? Okay, yeah, definitely not. No, you're right, because African lions live in Africa, and tigers live in... The Asia, jungle! In Asia. So, they would not meet. Yeah. What is the world's largest rodent? A chipmunk, a New York City rat, a capybara, or a marmot? A copybara. Very good. Because a copybara has been watching off often. Oh, that's what taught you about it? That's pretty yeah. cool. All right, true or false? Oceans at the North and South Pole are too cold for animals to live there. I'm going to go ahead and say true. Well, think about the ocean at the North and South Pole. Do you? Uh, definitely. 
Yeah, it's too cold for them to live there? Or there are animals that live there? There are animals that are built for the cold that live there. Exactly, so it's false. Many animals like polar bears live in the Arctic and penguins in the Antarctic have been adapted to the icy cold environments. Exactly. How many species become extinct every day? 10 to 20, 30 to 70, 80 to 120, or 150 to 200? Which one was the highest and which one was the shortest? The smallest was 10 to 20, and the highest was 150 to 200. I'm going to go with the lowest. Mm, it's actually the highest. 150 to 200 species become extinct every day. I feel bad for that now. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, I'm glad I'm going to be a vet when I grow up. Because I can help all those populations. Yep. You ready to do a math lab? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> All right, give me an occupation. Occupation. Which is a job. Oh, a job. I'm going to go with science. Because, well, this is supposed to be science. I don't want to make it weird. <laughs> okay. An adverb, which is something that describes a verb and normally ends in L-Y. So remember, kind of like um, quickly, slowly. Mm, yeah. Like in my book, my babies. Yeah. Hmm, so I'm going to go with fastly. Fastly. How about quickly? Yeah. That sounds okay. Okay, an adjective. That describes a noun, right? Very good. It does describe a noun. Hmm, I'm going to go with slimy. Slimy. That's that, a good one. And that's a word I don't like. <laughs> All right. Noun. Noun. I'm going to go with, uh, uh, what's that thing fancy that's a noun? Well, a person, place, or thing. I'm going to go with a book. A book? Okay. Because a book, like, has experience sometimes. All right. Another adjective? Another adjective. Um, nice, because nice. that's going to describe the book. Okay, another adjective? Cool. Okay, and a color? Green. Oh, I expected you to say pink. Yeah, but <laughs> science mostly has green in it, because look. Yeah, it's mostly green? Of, yeah. <laughs> Alright, another adjective? Another adjective. Oh, you're slimy already. Mm -hmm. Ooh, um, what about icky? Okay. Like it. It's icky. icky. All right, a part of the body. Part of the body. They're looking at somebody's eye. Okay, an eye. Which is a little gross. A noun. A noun. Uh, I'm gonna go with. That would be a thing, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so a piece of clothing. Clothing. Just to make this funny, I want to say panties. Okay, panties. <laughs> Hello, I am German science Albert Einstein. Some people say I look quickly insane, and they are right, I do. But I am not actually slimy. <laughs> this is just how I look. If you would like to look this like this too, use these makeover tips I have outlined below. Never comb your book. It is supposed to look like this. The more nice, the better, as I always say. It also helps if your hair is a cool shade of green. Make icky faces as often as possible. For example, stick out your eye in pictures. Yeah. Why? Because it's fun. Do this when your eager potion students photograph you. They will love it. Always wear a white lab panty. This <laughs> this way you will look like a real firefighter. <laughs> okay, that one's a good one. I like you think. Yeah, make sure you wear your white panties, huh? Yeah, wear your white panties to <clears throat> look like a firefighter. Okay, that is just so funny. You're still there. What? At least 
unless at least I didn't use my butt or stuff. Yeah. All right, today we are going to read about Jean, Joan Proctor, who was a zoologist. Excuse me, do you like my garden? I do, it's very good. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, keep building. All right, today we're gonna to read about Joan Proctor. She was a zoologist. Joan, Joan Proctor always had a fascination with reptiles. She was born in England in 1897 and grew up in a time when women were seen as dainty and reptiles were considered exotic and dangerous. Joan's chronic ill, chronic ill health kept her from going to a university, but it didn't keep her from studying the animals she loved. Joan kept snakes, frogs, and even a crocodile as pets. What? <laughs> okay, that is bad. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't oh, it? Can I see her? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's so beautiful. <laughs> hey, is that a chameleon or what? Probably because a chameleon would be a reptile, right? Yeah. <clears throat> she used her animals to present a paper to the Zoological so Society of London when she was only 19, and in 1917 she started officially working at the British Museum as an assistant to George Bullinger, keeper of the reptile and fishes. In 1923 she became the London Zoo's curator of reptiles and discovered a brand new species from Australia called the Peninsula Dragon Lizard. The newspaper went crazy for this small blonde woman handling huge pythons and lizards. To the public, it was very odd to see a woman to work with such creatures. She became famous at first for the novelty, but soon the world would see her genius. She worked closely with architects to design the zoo's reptile house, which was built in 1926, and it's still used today. It was the first of its kind, built specifically for the reptile's comfort. Joan was recognized as an expert in, her in herpology and published many papers on the science. Joan revealed that the secret of a zoo is to make animals feel at home. She used her artistic talents to make the environments look and feel like their natural habitat. On the job training and her special relationship with the animals made her an excellent veterinarian. Under her care, reptiles were living longer than ever before in captivity. Her love and understanding of these reptiles led her to get to know each animal as an individual. She even kept a tame Komodo dragon as a pet. Komodo dragon. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite lizards. Yeah. Her chronic ill health eventually caught up with her, and she would still come to work when she could, making her rounds in a wheelchair with her Komodo dragon on a leash. What? Yeah, so you can see it right here. She's got it on a leash. Aww. You know, I don't really like lizards, but the Komodo Dragon is one of my favorites. <clears throat> that is pretty cool, yeah, isn't it? it's super big and it's not as weird as lizards. It's kind of like a sneaky lizard. Yeah, it's kind of like a hybrid. Like... <laughs> I just like that. She died at the age of 34 in 1931, but her legacy lives on at the London Zoo. I feel sad for her. Yeah? Let's see. She fed her Komodo Dragon eggs from a spoon. She used a special glass in the reptile house so animals could receive the ultraviolet sunlight they needed. Her philosophy of creating a natural environment for the animals informs their way of modern zoos run today. Her mom was an artist. She, sh she showed how art and painted scenery can make all animals more comfortable. And she created a perfect temperature system so all reptiles were comfortable at the right temperature. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt them. No. I said, wow. That's okay. That's pretty awesome, though, right? She uh, did some really yeah. cool things. And you said she was a veterinarian. Yeah. Can I be her? Sure. Oh, I love Jane Goodall. Please, me. All right. So, Jane and the chimps. Jane was discouraged by how little progress she was making with the chimps. Then, to make matters work, she and Van both got sick. Make matters worse, she and Van both got sick very sick. Most likely both women had come down with malaria. They had no drugs back then with how to treat them. How, they had no drugs with them to treat the disease. And Jane had been told that there was no malaria at Gambia, so she didn't take the medicine along. And Jane blamed herself for that. For two weeks, Jane and her, who was Van to her, do you remember? Mom? Yep. Jane and her mother never left their tent. All they did was lie in a bed and sweat. Sweat, 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 and more sweat. Yeah, because malaria is a disease that is very widespread 
and people catch it from being bit by a specific kind of mosquito. Malaria does damage to the liver and blood cells, and the symptoms are very high fever, vomiting, chills, and bad headaches. Oh, no. Let's hope you don't get it. Yeah, no. That's what they had for two weeks. Oh, so it's, it won't, it, it's not here today? Um, I mean, it's more common. It says right here, people in Africa, south of the Sahara Desert, are most at risk. And we're not in Africa, so we're not at risk for it. Yeah, that's good. For many days, Van's fever rose as high as 105 degrees. Both Jane and Van were lucky. They recovered. The minute she felt well enough, Jane returned to the forest. At last, her patience paid off. It was October, and Van had gone home to England. Jane was on her own, and she began exploring an area she called the Peak. Every day, rain or shine, she climbed up the steep slope of the peak into the forest. Little by little, the chimps became used to Jane watching them. One day, she saw a female hold out her hand to a male who kissed it. She saw two baby chimps playing tug-of-war with a twig. Jane could tell many of the chimps apart, and she had given them names. Flo was an old female chimp. Jane liked Flo a lot. She was a very popular chimp, although to Jane at least, Flo was funny looking. She had a big round nose and torn ears, and Flo had a baby. Jane called her Fifi, and she called Fifi's older brothers Fobin and Figgin. Flo was a caring mother, and she protected Fifi from the rain. She carefully groomed her young. Flo was a playful mother, but she was also very firm. She never let her children get out of line. Ollie was Flo's friend, and Ollie was a female. Her face was very long, and her lips jiggled a lot. Another chimp, a male, looked a lot like Ollie. Jane was quite sure he was Ollie's brother, and she named him William. In animal studies, animals are usually giving nu given numbers, not names. In fact, many scientists think it's a bad idea to name animals that are being studied. They worry that it will make the animals seem too human. But Jane definitely did not think of the chimps as humans. She did see the chimps as individuals, though. They had different personalities. William was timid and fearful. Gilka was a show-off, always looking for attention. Frodo was a bully, a dangerous bully. One time, Jane had been watching Frodo when he suddenly charged, beat, and kicked her. Frodo started to leave and then came back and beat Jane more and dragged her to the edge of a cliff. What did Frodo do next? Dropped her. You're right. Yep. He threw her over the side. I remember you reading this. Yep. That's why I don't like Frodo. He is so mean. Frodo was a bully. It was a steep drop, but luckily there were bushes that stopped Jane's fall. Even so, she was banged up pretty badly. Let's hope she made a good recovery. Well, you know the answer to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In many ways, the chimps behaved like humans. Though unable to speak, they had their own means of communicating. Jane learned to tell what the different grunts, pants, and screams meant. For example, chimps greeted one another with soft, panting grunts, and a certain loud scream was a cry for help. Chimps, like humans, expressed feelings through gestures, and they hugged and kissed one another. They bowed to show respect, and they patted friends on the back for comfort. They also shook their fists or threw rocks to show anger. To Jane, naming the chimps just felt right. Did Jane have a favorite chimp? Um, what's his name? But did she have a favorite? Yes. Yes. Jane called him David... Graybeard, I can't <laughs> David Greybeard, because of his silvery hair around his chin. In one of her books, she wrote, David Greybeard had the most beautiful eyes of them all. Large and lustrous, set wide apart, they somehow expressed his whole personality. David Greybeard had a calm nature and was not afraid of Jane. He was the first chimp who seemed to accept her. One day, Jane held out a piece of fruit to David Greybeard. He came up to her, took the fruit, and then held, his hand in his, and then held her hands in his. What a special moment it was for Jane. David Greybeard taught Jane a lot about chimpanzees. For a long time, scientists believed that chimpanzees were herbivores. Herbivores are animals that eat what? Um, herbivores only eat plants. Very good. Herbivores are animals that only eat fruits and vegetables or plants. They do not eat meat. But one day, Jane saw David Greybeard and several other chimpanzees in the upper branches of a tree. They were stomping around... And, I'm sorry, they were grouped around something, and there seemed to be something that turned out to be... Yeah. Nope, it was a dead piglet. Oh, I <clears throat> David Graber handed out pieces of meat to others. He also let them bite off the meat for themselves, and for three hours, the chimps fed on the piglet. 
what Jane watched proved that chimps were... Um, I mean omnivores. Very good, omnivores, because omnivores eat what? They eat plants and it took me a few minutes to figure it out. I know, you always forget that word yeah. for omnivores. Omnivores, herbivores, carnivores, this all gets me... Um, Flustered? Yeah. Flustered. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> An omnivore eats meat as well as plants for as lot as well as lots of food from plants. This was interesting news, but a couple of weeks later, Jane came upon David Graybeard doing something even more amazing. It was a day of heavy rains, and Jane was tired and dripping wet. Through her binoculars, she spotted David Graybeard. He was squatting down by a nest of termites. Termites are insects that chimps like to eat. Termite nests are like big mounds with a hole at the top, and David Graybeard was poking a long blade of grass in the hole of the nest to fish out termites. Yeah, Why did Jane think this was so amazing? Do you remember? Um, because she's never seen this. Yeah, but it wasn't because she had never seen it. It was because David Graybeard was using the piece of grass as what? As a tool. Yeah, because he was using it as a tool. Yeah, and I know that, I know now because, now chimpanzees use all this nature as tools. Yep, why was this amazing? Because up until 1960, scientists believed humans were the only animals able to make tools. Making tools may not sound like a big deal, but think about it. A dog digs a hole with its paws. It does not make a shovel to dig a deeper hole, and its paws are not able to hold a shovel. Yep. Um, I also know something that chimpanzees and humans have in common. What? Um, actually two things. Okay. First, they don't have any tails because they're kind of like a orangutan. Yeah. And all of them. And they also have thumbs. They do have thumbs. So if they don't have a tail, does that make them a monkey or an ape? It makes them an ape because they're, and they're also like humans because humans don't have tails either and they have thumbs. Just like the chimpanzees. Yep. Very good. So chimps have big brains. They also have thumbs. Still, scientists did not think that Chips knew how to make tools, but Jane watched David Graybeer do exactly that. Once David Graybeer was gone, Jane went over to get a closer look at the grass tools. Jane tried pushing one into the nest herself. Sure enough, she could feel termites grab a hold of the grass, and when she took out the blade of grass, the termites were kicking their legs about. In her book, A Reason for Hope, Jane wrote that it was hard for me to believe what I had seen. It had long been thought that they were the only creatures on earth used to make tools used and made tools, but what she saw proved that that was not so. Another time, Jane came upon David Graybeard and a big strong chip named Goliath, and they were fishing for termites together. They kept a supply of extra grass tools in case any broke. Sometimes they picked up twigs and stripped off the leaves before using them. Again, this might not sound that astounding, but the chips were making changes to the twigs so that they worked better as tools. Chips also used chewed clumps of leaves as sponges to soak up drinking water. Yeah, that's smart, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. I want to be a chimpanzee. Why do you want to be a chimpanzee? Because chimpanzees are so cool. And they're one of my favorite apes. The spider monkey is one of my favorite monkeys. Yeah? If you were a chimpanzee, would you want to be one of the chimpanzees that Jane Goodall researched? Um, no, but I would like to be um, Jujube. Oh, you want to be her little stuffed animal? Yeah, but I want to be real. You want to be her real chimpanzee pet? Yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What if I had a pet chimpanzee named Jujubee? That's a baby. Oh, so you want a pet chimpanzee? Yeah. Or I can turn into one if I was a wild rat. <laughs> oh, yeah. you are crazy, kiddo. Or if magic was real. <laughs> or if magic was real? Yeah. You're crazy. Lewis Leakey was thrilled when Jane sent news of David Graybeard's fishing trips. Leakey knew he'd been right about sending Jane Goodall to Gombe. He spread the word of what she was learning, and it did not take long for the National Geographic Society to give Jane enough money to stay at Gombe for another year. It was the best gift in the world. Evelyn the Adventurous Entomologist, the true story of the world-traveling bug hunter. Back in 1881, when Evelyn Cheeseman was born, most people thought girls should be quiet, clean, covered with lace, and little Victorian girls were definitely not supposed to go on bug hunts. But, Evelyn... She 
one went. Anyway. Yep, Evelyn went anyway. She explored forests and splashed in ponds with her brothers and sisters. She crawled in mud and stuffed her pockets with bugs. How could you possibly know? <laughs> Jars of glowworms sparkled while she dreamed about the world beyond her small English home. Many years later, Evelyn applied to veterinarian college because she longed to help sick animals. However, it was the early 1900s and women couldn't vote, and they rarely went to college. They certainly were not allowed to be veterinarians. But she did anyway. Well, she's going to try, huh? Mm -hmm. So she did the next best thing and trained as a canine nurse, hoping the veterinarian colleges would open to women after a few years. Evelyn cared for sick greyhounds, bulldogs, and terriers. She fed the dogs, took their temperatures, and gave them medicine, but in her heart, she still wanted to be a vet. One day, Evelyn's friend Grace wrote that her cousin, Professor Lefroy, was desperate for someone to run London Zoo's insect house. A woman had never been in charge of the insect house before. But she did it anyway. But Evelyn went anyway. A single beetle paddled in a giant tank, but the rest of the insect house echoed. It had been neglected while zookeepers, along with millions of other men, served in the First World War. Evelyn agreed to give the job a try. So that's it. The whole insect house was one beetle. That's all they had. She scooped insects from London's ponds and streams. She asked local children to find caterpillars, beetles, and snails to star in her exhibits. And she studied entomology, exploring insect books for wonders to share. Aww, that's nice. <clears throat> After a few weeks of bug hunting, the tanks were full, and so was Evelyn's heart. In the insect house, Evelyn spun stories for curious visitors. She showed them tiny ants carrying pine needles to build their homes, a water snail crawling up glass in its muscular foot, and butterflies sipping nectar. Crowds swarmed the insect house to watch. Evelyn's bugs creep and slide and scurry. Now there's no more, just one beetle. Yeah, there's a whole house full now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Evelyn still dreamed about places beyond her small world, but now she also dreamed about insects that she had never studied, and about stories that, that were untold. Even when the veterinarian college opened its door to women, finally, Evelyn knew she never wanted to leave the world of insects. So, in 1924, she heard about an expedition to study tropical insects, and in those days, women scientists and explorers were rare. People just thought it wasn't safe. Women should be at home, but... She did anyway. She won anyway. After traveling on a rolling ocean for over 5,000 miles, Evelyn explored the Pacific Islands from sunrise to sunset. She chased centipedes, caught butterflies, and stalked giant land snails. Ooh, on the island of Gorgona, Evelyn studied, stumbled into a sticky curtain of spider webs. As the spiders watched, she bit and pulled and kicked the threads. There was no escape. Then Evelyn remembered the metal nail file in her pocket, and she hacked each sticky strand one by one and emerged from the spidery cocoon. On the island of Nukahiva, Evelyn wanted to scale a steep cliff that she was sure revealed some interesting insects. The villagers told Evelyn that only one man had ever climbed it, and they told her not to go. But she did anyway. But Evelyn went anyway. And she always scraped cuts yeah. on her knees. After hours of climbing, Evelyn was rewarded with buzzing bees and wasps, beetles, and grasshoppers. However, she soon realized she had made a terrible mistake because she had forgotten the fresh lime she planned, lime she planned to squeeze and drink. As Evelyn hunted for a stream, she slipped, she grasped at plants, and she kept tumbling. Until she clung to a bush and stopped, all alone, Evelyn had to save herself. She inched slowly up the cliff like a caterpillar. Evelyn her, had survived another adventure, and her backpack was full of insects that had survived too. Evelyn kept traveling and studying insects, and in 1925, she sailed to Tahiti, where she discovered a new species of grasshopper. In 1934, she explored New Guinea and found a new species of beetle. In 1938, she found a new blue orchid at top of an extinct volcano and well, yes. What's in New Guinea? New Guinea is just a place. We'll look at it in the map in just a second. And in 1955, the Queen of England awarded Evelyn an OBE, Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire for her services to science. Evelyn never stopped working even after her hair turned white and her body ached. For nearly 30 years, this adventurous entomologist climbed mountains, explored jungles, and collected insects. Then she spun her stories into books, inspiring others to be like Evelyn. And go anyway.
Today's giveaway is for the Alphabet Fun Pack. The Alphabet Fun Pack includes everything you need to help your little ones learn their letters and sounds in a play-based, hands-on way. They will be having so much fun they won't even realize they're learning. In order to enter, you must be a subscriber, like this video, and leave a comment down below.